All the horror, cruelty and misery of life can be found in a country's law courts. And if you were to visit a police court in the Victorian era, then the terrible sights you would see would leave you in disbelief at the crime, poverty and suffering of the people that found themselves in squalid cells, awaiting their fate. In the 1880s, a man decided to work among the poor and outcasts of society by becoming a police court missionary, with the aim of illustrating London's social problems. He was not prepared for the wrecked lives and despair he would discover, coming to realise that no amount of temperance pledges, tracts and rescue homes would alleviate the suffering of the poor, unfortunate and downcast, for he considered the scenes he witnessed akin to Dante's epic poem of the Inferno, A Journey Through Hell. In this account of his first day at Lambeth Police Court, you will discover how the horrific scenes he encountered had such a profound effect on him that he was reduced to tears and left with constant nightmares. Before we move on, if you're interested in history like this and you want to find out more about what life was really like for people in the past, Please consider subscribing for more content. If you'd like to support what we make for you, check out the description for links to ways you can help us to continue bringing the past alive. It was one Monday in May that I first saw the inside of a London police court. It is fifteen years ago, but that day is still fresh in my memory. Nay, rather it is burned into my very consciousness. There was I, up from the country, with great hopes of doing good, and not altogether ignorant of the world of the vices and sorrows of our large cities. But a revelation awaited me. I spent that day in a horrible wonderland, and although dazed and afraid to speak to anyone, I noticed everything and everybody, and I have a mental photograph of it all now. Even as I sit and write, it is all before me and around. I hear again the horrible speech and diverse tongues, I hear the accents of sorrow and the burst of angry sound. I hear the devil-may-care laugh and the contemptuous expression. I hear the sighs and groans and bitter plaints. I see men shorn of all glory. I see womanhood clothed in shame. I see vice rampant. I see misery crawling. I see the long procession of the drink or vice-stricken as they tramp down to the place of wrecked lives and slain souls. I see some going cursing to destruction. I see some going jesting to destruction. I see some more going down with open eyes and passive will. I see some that long to be delivered from their body of death. I hear the unuttered cry, the waters have gone over me, the waters have gone over me, out of the black depths do I cry to be delivered. And I was there to deliver them. But I see and hear more, I see women with bruised and battered faces, I see their cuts and wounds and putrefying sores, I hear stories of devilish cruelty, and I hear the poor bruised women pleading that their husbands may not be punished for their cruelty. Don't send him to prison. Don't send him to prison. He is a good husband when he is sober. I hear the words again and again. I see more women with poor, thin clothing. I look into their faces, and I see sorrow writ large and rings of care around their eyes, and in their hearts a weight of agony that makes them ready to curse God and die. My God! And I was there to comfort them. I see more. I see the children, old before their time, looking up with pale and piteous faces. I see some with blighted bodies, and I know that rounded limbs and happy hearts are not for them. Still more do I see matronly women, charged with being drunk, holding in their arms little bits of mortality. Puling cries are heard, but soon hushed, for I see the little ones draw from their mothers that leprous distilment that shall blast their lives and wither their bodies. I see more, young men to whom obscenity is the breath of life, and immorality the highest good. I see some young in years who have already come to the wayside of life, for their bones are full of sin. I see young women, sometimes fair and sometimes foul to look upon, but whether fair or foul, half-beast and half-human, 
I hear stories of lust, drunkenness, and theft. I see the smartly dressed harpies who farm them waiting to pay their fines. I see the most despicable of all mankind, the fellows who live upon them, hovering by like beasts of prey. I see old men of threescore and ten, and old women of equal age, whose tottering limbs have borne them from the workhouse to the public-house, that they might drink and forget their misery once more before they die. I see them all. They are around me now. I breathe again the sickening whiff of stale debauch. I am faint with the unspeakable atmosphere. The chloride of lime is again in my throat, and my nostrils tingle with it. But I see more. I see the matter-of-fact way in which all this was received. I see that no one wonders at it. I see that all this is looked upon as perfectly natural. For I see no look of wonder, no divine pity, no burning indignation. All, all received as a perfect matter of course, and all, all quite as it should be. Now, what I saw, dear listener, on that particular Monday in that particular court, you may see on any Monday in any of our metropolitan police courts, and on any other day, only in a less degree. Year in and year out, the procession of the sinning and sorrowing passes through all our courts. Prison and death thin the ranks of the procession. But the public house is a grand recruiting agency, and neither police nor magistrates are likely to be idle. Neither is the procession likely to dwindle, or the yell of the trampled wife to cease while the public house holds its triumphant sway. But while you may see what I have described almost any day, there is much that you cannot see, and which, please God, I shall never see again. So come with me, in imagination, into the prisoner's waiting room on that particular Monday morning, for it is well you should know that some changes for the better have taken place in London police courts. Out of a long corridor thronged with policemen, we turn into the waiting room, where the prisoners, excepting some few who are in the cells, wait their turn to appear before the magistrate. There is a long list on the wall, with the name of each prisoner and number of the officer who has charge of each case, and showing the order in which they will have to appear. Scan the list, and you will see the part drink plays in it. Drunk and disorderly, or drunk and something else, is appended to fifty out of the sixty names on the list. Is it a Lazar house we are in? A building for housing lepers and patients with infectious disease. Oh, no! It is part of an English court of justice in the metropolis of all civilization. Never mind the sickening atmosphere, heavily laden as it is with the fumes of beer and spirits. Look around you. You feel sick and faint? You must bear up, for we want to see the prisoners. What is that lying on the floor? That is a woman. She has had a fit, and there she lies with a bag of straw under her head, and not a single woman in the place whose duty it is to attend to her. What is that cowering in the corner? Well, that has been a woman driven years ago by the devil of sensuality into the wilderness of sin, where she talked to herself other devils. But only one has her in his grip now, and he will not let her go. Drink! 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 The devil says to her, and she is a dying piece of flesh whose only capability is the absorption of alcohol. That in the other corner is reported to be a woman, she has got men's boots on, no hat or bonnet, no jacket or mantle. Her arms are bare. Her dress, what there is of it, is short. Her forehead is low. Her broad face is cut and bruised. Her eyes are inflamed, and her hair hangs loosely down. Twenty-four years of age, they say, and she has been in that corner one hundred and fifty times, and there's another hundred to follow. Poor Kate Hennessy, an Irish girl of the slum, a mother at fifteen, 
Every man's hand is against her, and verily hers is against every man. But we hear voices all around us. Listen. Fast young men are exchanging coarse obscenities with that group of unfortunates, and no one says them nay. Listen. Businessmen are cursing the delay of the magistrate and the impertinence of the police, for they want to pay their fines and be gone. Listen. You hear a girl of tender years bitterly crying. You hear a doddering old woman talking to herself. You hear knowing men proclaiming the iniquities of the police. You hear the loud laugh that tells the life history of the laugher. You hear someone faintly ask for water. Look at him, a well-dressed, middle-aged man. Shaking in every limb as with palsy, he is nearly in delirium tremens. How the water gurgles down his hot throat. He does not know his name. He cannot tell whence he comes, and when put into the cells, the furies will be with him and upon him. You hear someone crooning snatches of good music. She has been here fifty times, a woman from a home of culture. She is half drunk now, and the old songs come back to her. Although she has got to the lowest depth and rolls with pleasure in her sensual sty. Anybody got a smelling bottle? They might as well ask for the moon. And so the decent-looking woman faints. And well, she may. It is her first appearance here. She has been picked up drunk. Shame and fear, horror and sickness, take hold of her. No female attendant. So the unfortunates take off her bonnet, unfasten the front of her dress, and rub her hands till she slowly recovers her dreadful consciousness. Here is a group of boys charged with gambling. Here, a couple of fourteen-year-old girls with being disorderly. Here, a mother and her babe. Here, a young clerk charged with embezzlement. Here, the old couple from the workhouse whose every returning holiday from the house finds them in the public house. Mix them up, old and young, pure and impure, male and female, drunk and sober, cleanly and verminous. Dante ought to have seen that room, have tasted that atmosphere, have listened to the various sounds in major and in minor keys. All the social problems of the day were in that room. All the vices and sorrows of life were personified in it. This is no exaggerated picture. Not in the least is it overdrawn. I do not wish to give fuller particulars. I dare not if I would. No publisher would publish. No printer would print. An exactly faithful account of a prisoner's waiting room of even twelve years ago. Rescue them! said my employers. And the last day of every month a small cheque shall be your award. How am I to do it? Here's a temperance pledge book. Take pledges. But there are others. Give them tracts. But there are the hungry and homeless to feed. Give them tracts. There are the poor wantons. Take them to rescue homes, and let them work out their own salvation at the wash-tubs. Verily. If temperance pledges, tracts, and wash-tubs could save humanity, we had the millennium long ago. Good, religious, and well-meaning people talk very serenely, and with rare unction, about engaging in rescue work. I doubt much if they know what they talk about. Have they ever thrown themselves into the very existence of a drink or vice-possessed man or woman? Have they ever stood in front of such a one and said, Hold, you shall not go to destruction. Have they ever taken women possessed of an unclean spirit into their own homes to try what human sympathy and timely help would do for such? If not, let them do it, and I venture to say they will hold their peace or speak with less assurance. I was afraid of my work that first day. Neither did I require the phrenologist to tell me that I had made a mistake. But there are other parts of the police court to explore. Come to the cells, down the corridor, past the jailer's office, turn to the right. There they are, all in a row. It is afternoon, 
and they are pretty full. The prisoners have been reeled off by the magistrate, and some are going to prison and some are hoping for the coming of friends to bring the money for their fines. The prisoner's van has not yet arrived, so we have time to see the prisoners. Come along. Do you feel bad already? You see the little trapdoors about nine inches square in the doors of the cells? They are open, lying at a right angle outward. Put your face to one and look in. Ah, now you have got the full flavour of a London police court. One gulp is enough. How would you like to swallow some of that every day? You shudder. What, not for a small check once a month? Look again. It won't be so bad next time. You look and hold your breath. While you gaze, you get used to the semi-darkness and find you are looking into a woman's cell. For they do divide the sexes after they have been before the magistrate. There is Kate in the corner, but her blucher boots are gone. The jailer has taken them away because of her persistent kicking at the door. There is the festering piece of humanity in the other corner. There is the young girl who has stolen. There is the mother with her babe, for her fine has not yet been paid, and there are others in that low, square, dark cell, with its sanitary arrangements in the corner, and no female attendant on the premises. Shall we look into the men's cells? No? You have had enough. So have I. And here comes Black Maria. A door at the bottom of the cell passage is opened, and there stands the prisoner's van with its steps let down, its back door open, and its cupboards unfastened, yawning like the grave for their prey. The jailer hands a list of prisoners to the sergeant in charge of the van. The cell doors, one by one, are unlocked. From their cells to their cupboards the prisoners go. The cupboard doors are fastened, the back door is locked, the whip cracks, and away with its human freight of vice, misery, and despair goes the prisoner's van. And I was there to save them. I went into Kennington Park, sat down, and cried like a child. Thus ended my first day in a London police court. Kind listener, do not say I am talking cant. Strictly religious friend, do not say I am impious. But that night I was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. Ay, and for days and months afterwards my sleep broke from me, and I wonder how many times in the small hours of the morning my wife has said to me, Now you are not asleep, you are bothering your head again. Why, they were looking at me, mowing and jibing at me mocking at me, with outstretched hands appealing to me, the people whom I was paid to save and didn't. If I dozed a little, I then began to talk nonsense, and my wife declares that I repeated hosey-tosey, hosey-tosey hundreds of times. I wouldn't like to go again through my first year's experience. What a pitiful position mine was. No friends in London, to go day after day to meet with abject poverty, hopeless misery, and unspeakable sorrows, to have a full heart and empty hands. I have said many a time to myself, Thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. It was deep. Too deep. I wonder how it is that folk undoubtedly good think that poor humanity can be warmed, fed, and comforted with tracts, or be saved with goody stories. Poor humanity doesn't much care for advice gratis, though some folk seem sent into the world on purpose to bestow it. Just about my darkest days in my police court experience, a well-known lady invited me to her house to meet a famous religious philanthropist. She wished me to tell him about my work, this gentleman gave very large sums in aid of revivals, etc. I could not tell him of the souls I had saved, or of very much good I had done, but I told him of my opportunities, of the humanity that I loved, of the wants of the poor, 
of their temptations and sufferings, and of their patience and self-denial. I think I was just getting a bit eloquent when he burst in, and in a knock-down manner said, Do you give them Christ? I'm afraid that I was vexed, for I replied, Sir, I cannot carry Christ in parcels and distribute him. I can only do as I think he would have done. How's that? I give them myself. That closed the interview, for neither lady nor gentleman wanted to hear more. Yes, I had to give them myself, for I had nothing else to give them in those days. And no one can say that I spared myself. But it meant something, for it nearly proved too much for me.